Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. Oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I see. Good evening. Welcome to another Sunday night class. Um, last Sunday morning, somebody told me that it might not be appropriate to talk about, you know, sports, Razorback sports, and, you know, and I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I, boy, I agree with that. You know, we probably, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't talk about it. Um, I don't know. This, this, by the way, as of, as of middle of this last week, we, were, we had won 10 SEC games in a row. So, you know, anyway. Okay, so there's so so I actually have a joke for this week. Uh, I was a preacher. Another family from the church lives near them, so the families visit a lot back and forth in their homes. And she is kind of puzzled by his personality uh, change. At home, he's shy and he's quiet and he's retiring. Which, and uh, but in church, he's a really fiery orator, and he rouses the masses in the name of of God and. And uh, it's as if he was two different people. So one day she asked about the dramatic transformation that seems to come over him. And he said, oh, that's easy to explain. That's my alter ego. Somebody else at your house can explain it to you, you know, later, if you didn't get it. Let's, let's, start, with a, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, a beautiful week that you've given us. And we thank you for another opportunity to gather together. And to study your word, what an amazing story. It is your son coming to this earth. And as we look into Luke's account again and, and we uh, see uh, Jesus as he has uh, been arrested, we ask that you might open us up to what we need to learn here, uh, what we need to see both about him and what he offered to us and what it teaches us about ourselves and how we can be more like him. We, we ask your blessing on this evening, we ask your blessing on all who are listening. Uh, may we gain from this uh, both the strength and the cur and the willingness uh, to be more like Him as we walk through our day. And it's in His uh, and in His name that we pray. Amen. Uh, as I said, uh, Jesus, of course, has been has been arrested in the garden. You remember He had to cut His disciples off uh, when it came to the to uh, using the swords in the garden. Uh, and so he now has been uh, taken, uh, he's about to get taken before uh, the Jewish uh, leadership, and that's where we'll start. If you got your Bible with you, we're still in Luke 22. We're about to move to the end of that chapter. Uh, and we're going to start in verse 66. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together. 
and Jesus was led before them. If you're the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you'll not believe me. If I asked you, you wouldn't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We've heard it from his own lips. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of things about, <clears throat> particularly the interaction with the Jewish leadership, Herod, uh, Pilate, that Luke does not uh, cover in the same fashion that, that, that the other Gospels do. But remember, Luke has been very faithful uh, all during this last week of Jesus' life to uh, emphasize uh, the questions that they are answering him, hoping to trap him. Uh, asking uh, questions, hoping that he'll do something that will either, that, that they can claim is a breaking of the law or that the people will be unhappy about. That would, that would have been the one about taxation. Uh, so that they can get him in trouble, that they can get him in trouble. This question, which they're going to they're going to ask him, and Pilate's going to ask him the same question, is really the culmination of this series of questions that's been going on for the whole week, and and this one, they and Pilate need or desire a specific answer from him. Uh, they they say when a, uh, a lawyer goes into a court of law, he's not supposed to ask any questions he doesn't already know the answer to. Well. They, they didn't ask the question. We think about asking a question and waiting to hear what the answer is. That's why we ask the question. They are asking, looking for a specific uh, answer. Actually, Pilate is too. And so the first little bit here that what I, I want us to spend together tonight, we're looking at both of these questions. We're looking at Jesus' answer and, and, and why they're asking what they're asking. In their case, of course, they are shooting for blasphemy. Now, blasphemy, understand, blasphemy doesn't get him uh, crucified. And we'll actually see that when he's before Pilate. They need something that, that will cause the Romans to consider him a threat to Rome in order to be crucified. But blasphemy gets him turned against the people because, the pe because blasphemy is... Number one on the hit list, if you will, in, among, among Jews as a, as a no-no in your life. God is God. Now, they really were not worshiping him right. They were certainly not loving him. They were following the law for their own sakes. But they still held the name of God in high esteem. And so blasphemy was considered the one thing that would really cause him, it was what they believed would cause him problems with the people. And so he, they asked the question, are you the Messiah? Now, the interesting thing is, of course, Jesus' initial answer is, the reality is, you know, if I, if I did answer, you wouldn't believe me anyway. So, so in, in the one case, it's a waste of time. If I actually asked you what your answer is, you wouldn't say anything. And we've seen that actually, have we not, with some of the questions that they've asked him before, because he's kind of thrown it back at them. And they've been silent because they were afraid. Remember about John the Baptist. Did he come from God or did he come from Satan? They, they were afraid of the people and were afraid to answer. And so he says, I, I wouldn't get an answer from you anyway. And so he says what sounds cryptic, but it's actually, a, it's actually prophetic. The Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of God Almighty. And so they, they kind of key on that and they say, okay, that's great. All right, so are you the Son of Man? Are, is that who... You are. Are you the son of God? See? And he says, you say so. Well, you say so. Now, for three and a half years, the people have been saying so. The religious leaders have heard this. There are some among the religious leaders that actually lean toward this, a Nicodemus. Even later on, remember in the book of Acts, a Gamaliel, that, that, that actually lean toward this because they know what the prophecies are. They, they know what was coming. They know what was supposed to be coming even though they didn't understand it. And Jesus is matching perfectly what the prophecies have been saying all along. And so he, he puts it back out there to them and he says, you said so. Now the interesting thing always to me in here is he does not say it himself. And he's not being, he's not being coy. He's saying it's out there. It's being said, it's out there. 
and they say, what do we need any, any testimony for? We can, we can arrest him. The amazing thing is, and I, 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 I've asked this before when I've taught uh, this lesson, when I've been teaching this book. What do you think of when you think in the Lord's Supper? What, 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 where, do you, where do your thoughts center when you're taking communion? A lot of people, it's the cross. I've had people answer that before in class. A lot of people, it's Jesus coming to earth. I guess the thing that always hits me is his innocence. Now, I, I know it's perfection, okay, but his innocence. He didn't do anything wrong. He did nothing wrong ever. They were so determined for him to die that a non-answer, and they say, well, that's it. We have enough information. What do we need? Now, I'll tell you what they needed. They still needed to pay off witnesses to come in and falsely testify against him because, again, they still did not have the blasphemy charge uh, nailed down because he hadn't said anything. But they, but they knew they were so desperate it didn't matter at this point. See, they wanted to trip him up about paying taxes. They couldn't do it. They wanted to trip him up about paying who is the, where the authority came from. They couldn't do it. They wanted to trip him up here by flat out asking him, are you the son of God? They couldn't do it. And it didn't matter. He had to die. And they played right into the hands of God because he did have to die for us. Look at the beginning of chapter 23. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar, claims to be a Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. The lies start. We have found this man subverting our nation. No, we haven't. We found this man going around and teaching about the love of God and healing people. We found this man trying to rise up an insurrection in this nation. No, we haven't. We've, gone this, we've found this man going around and, and, and teaching the truth about God Almighty and what he desires for us and has been, and been feeding people. We've, we've found this man trying to, trying to destroy our nation. No, we haven't. You found this man in truth raising in the power of his father people from the dead. They throw, out the, they, they throw out the one, a lie that they hope will get Pilate's attention. He claims to be, that, that he refuses to pay taxes to Caesar, which by the way, if you'll remember the question on paying taxes, what did he say? Give to Caesar what is? Caesar's and to give to God what is God's he said as a matter of fact it was part and parcel to what he said to his disciples when he said you're in the world and not of the world it part and parcel to what Paul will later elaborate on when he says that that we 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 bow knee to and we obey and we are we are we are faithful to the laws of the land and to the rulers of the land why because God put the rulers in charge and we in following the laws honor God and bring glory to him through our life in this world But it doesn't matter. They desperately want to get the Romans involved, and so, of course, and then they throw out the claim that he needs, that he's a Messiah, a king. And as Pilate asks the same question, are you the king of the Jews? Is that who you are? Now, I told you they needed an answer to kill him. They needed, the, him to, they needed an answer that might subvert his work, might subvert his name. Pilate needs an answer that keeps the peace. Pilate doesn't care about anything but keeping his job. And his job, is, he, his job is maintained by having Jerusalem be a peaceful place that pays taxes and doesn't cause Rome any problems. And so Pilate could care less what the answer actually is. Pilate is looking for a way to keep the peace. So he's got the, Roman, the Jewish leadership screaming in one ear... He's got Jesus offering up what he look, what sounds like a non-answer in the other year, and he's trying to figure out a way to not end, have this end up being a riot in Jerusalem. Which with the crowd that's gathering, it's looking exactly that way. 
Why does Jesus say it this way to both of them? It's because Jesus, Jesus never did anything to subvert. Jesus never did anything to break the law. Jesus never did anything to try and cause trouble. And in fact, he still offers up the truth. It is out there. At Caesarea Philippi, one of the answers that they gave him was, see, was in fact, was in fact that they, some were saying that he was the prophet. Some were saying he was John the Baptist come back to life. But the reality is the word was out there too that he was the Messiah. He says, you've said so. What does our life say about who Jesus is? What does our actions towards each other say about who Jesus is? What does our life in this world say? We're in a pretty hateful place right now. I've been thinking about this a lot because of my Wednesday night study in Acts and in chapter 13, starting chapter 13, this past Wednesday night, and... and It's so easy in this room with people who we sort of speak the same language with and, and, and you know, that, we, that we, get to, we get to project Christ-like. But how's our Christ-like projection going when it's a person of another skin color who doesn't care for us? When it's somebody who's in the country illegally, what's our feelings about that and our actions toward them. When it's somebody who's taken the job that you desperately needed. You see, Jesus doesn't just, again, Jesus doesn't just want to put, up, put, put the truth out there. Jesus wants to challenge, and, he, and I don't believe, I don't know that he's necessarily challenging Pilate, but I, I guarantee you, and I've been talking about this for about six weeks now, that, that Jesus has been trying to desperately get the Jewish leadership to hear the truth. To hear and believe, to change themselves, and to trust in what God had done for them. He asked them, what do you say? What do we say today? Verse 4, Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. By the way, that'll be the first of three times this is going to happen. But they insisted. He stirred up all the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee, is, Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. You know, it, it's an interesting thing. Depending on how you say something, how you say something really can have a pretty different slant from somebody. Did Jesus stir the people up all over Judea and Galilee with his teaching? Absolutely. Did he, cause an, was, did he stir to an insurrection? Absolutely not. Did Jesus excite the crowds by, by, his, by the miracles and by the actions that he caused, that he, that he brought, you know, to people's lives? Absolutely. But did he cause people to want to riot away from Rome and, and you know, and, and to cause problems? Absolutely not. They know this, but they keep, keep pushing it anyway. And, of course, because the first time now, Pilate is going, listen, I've questioned him. I've listened to what you've said. And I think Pilate wasn't any idiot. He was pretty, he was pretty dishonest, but I don't think he was an idiot. I, I, think he, I think he understood what was going on here, and he could see that this was trumped up. This wasn't Barabbas, th that this was trumped up. Charges, see? And so he says, I find no basis to charge him. And they go, oh, no, he's a troublemaker. But as soon as he gets Galilee, see, he gets an opening. He goes, Herod who's not Jewish, but you'll remember that Herod is king up in, Gal up in Galilee. He can turn it over to him legally and let him to decide. And so he sends him to Herod. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he'd been wanting to see him. 
From what he'd heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Now, Herod, and this is Herod, the original Herod's grandson. Herod is, by most scholarship, considered pretty much certifiably unbalanced. You know, to say crazy, I mean, but, but he, 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 he wasn't, he wasn't a, a particularly stable individual. Herod was almost like, this Herod was almost like a clown in the role uh, because he was really a puppet to Rome and he, he didn't really have any authority, but he had a lot of pomp and circumstance around him. And so Herod, Herod had heard how famous Jesus was. Herod had heard about the miracles and much like the people in Nazareth, all Herod was interested in was a show. Herod wanted to see something. See, he wanted to see something great happen. He wanted to you know, see something fancy. He was hoping that some sleight of hand, some, some, that Jesus would do something that would entertain him. I always got to be careful with this one. There, there are a lot of people who come to church to be entertained. They want to feel better about themselves. By the way, and I think people should feel better about themselves when they gather together with the Lord's people. They, 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 they want to be picked, perked up for the rest of the week. They want, they want the show to be, to be uh, uh, fast and snappy so that they go out of there humming a happy tune and feeling better. And by the way, again, I don't have any problem with feeling better. I, I hope that people do. I don't have any problem with hum, going out and humming a tune. Actually, a lot of times I kind of had the last song the, that we sang stuck in my head. I, you know, I don't have any problem with those things, but, uh, but, but, but I think we need to take care. We are coming to glorify God. We're coming together to learn what we're supposed to do in being about God's business in our lives. There's room to rejoice. There, there's room for joy. There's, there's room for happiness. And there's plenty of times that I think the, the song service and things that are going on and, and getting to uh, uh, you know, honor, the, honor one another with things that are happening in our lives and all those things are great and all those things make me feel better about, but, but I don't come for the, joy, for the joy of myself. I come for the joy of the Lord. All I had cared about was to be entertained. So Jesus, he pushes him with questions, applies him with questions, and Jesus gives him nothing but silence. And I guess he got pretty frustrated about that. But I love verse 10. He got, this is a picture you got to have. The chief priests and the teachers of the law are standing there vehemently accusing him. Now, okay, now what you got to picture is, once again, okay, with, with, with Pilate, Jesus is standing there, and Pilate's saying, listen, are you the king of the Jews? You know, and, and Jesus goes, well, you, you know, you've said so. I mean, that, that's it. And, and over here on the side of these guys, vehemently throwing out everything they can think of to get Pilate to get mad at Jesus. Now they're in Herod's palace, and, and he's going, you know, he's asked applying with questions because he's hoping that Jesus will give him something, you know, some sort of entertainment. And over here, he's got those same guys screaming at him in his ear, vehemently accusing him, see? How is it possible that people who knew the law backwards and forwards and all the prophecies couldn't see what was right in front of them? But maybe even deeper than that, how is it possible that they so loved their jobs and their position that it carried them to this level of hatred for him? I told you Herod was unbalanced. Herod had no reason to do anything to Jesus. Herod had no cause to react in any way, but since he didn't get entertainment from him, he turned his soldiers loose on him to entertain Herod. His soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. By the way, ridiculed and mocked doesn't sound like much. That sounds like a a school kid kind of, you know, calling another kid fatty in the hallway. We're talking actually beatings and slapped him around. This wasn't just verbal. They abused him. 
The end of verse 12 has always been interesting. That day it says Herod and Pilate became friends. I told you that the, the thing is, Pilate really had no use for Herod. Again, he was sort of a, a middleman that he didn't really want around anyway. Herod was, was, was named a king because they were allowed to have a king in Israel. But Pilate was the proconsul. He was the governor from Rome, and he was the real authority in the area. And so Pilate didn't much care for him. Herod didn't care for Pilate because he didn't really like the Romans, but he appeased him whenever, as much as he had to. But the people didn't really like him either. So he was really kind of stuck in the middle between two groups who didn't care for him at all. And so they didn't have any love for each other. And this verse used to perplex me. From this moment on, they became friends. before they had been enemies. Because both men cared for one thing, cared for their position. Both men cared for, for one thing, that, that there was no insurrection, there was no problem, because for sure it would cause Pilate his job, and it probably would cause Herod his, call, cause Herod his life if, if things had gotten, gone south in Israel. And so the two of them knew that there was one thing that they had to do, and that was keep the peace. Herod didn't have an answer for it, so he sends him back to Pilate. Pilate called the chief priests together, the rulers and the people, said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. Untrue. I've examined him in your presence and have found no basis for the charges against him. Second time. Neither was, has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Now he adds something to it this time. He says, therefore, what I'll do is I'll punish him before I release him. And now, of course, what we're talking about is we're talking about the flogging that the Romans were so good at. There was a guy at a camp that I had when I, I, I was, used to run Central Florida Bible Camp, and, I, and they, we, we had a... Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the weeks, we had a fellow come in and he demonstrated how the Roman flogging went. And what he had actually done was he designed for himself, basically on a wood, a piece of wood, had designed himself leather that was, act, was, was fairly simulated for human skin. And then he took and he had crafted for himself exactly what they are. And, of course, it was a piece of leather that had bone and rocks and, you know, a piece of glass and whatever it was. They were actually it, it stuck on, onto the, 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 the leather strap. And that's what they used to flog. And they'd flog 39 times. They were good at it, by the way. If the flogger killed the man... While he was flogging him, the flogger got flogged. So they knew how to take him to the, an inch of death without killing them. This fellow at Central Florida Bible Camp started in on this thing, and he was reading the story, and he was teaching as he went along, and, 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 and you know, and he said, and, and this, of course, the sound, the sound was pretty unnerving as it was, and, you know, and he's, and he's popping this thing, and he's popping this thing, and he's popping this thing, and he turned it around for everybody, and the thing was completely shredded. It was gone. That was Jesus back, by the way. See, Herod wasn't doing Jesus any favor. Herod was trying to do Herod, or Pilate wasn't doing himself Jesus any favors. He was trying to do Pilate a favor. He didn't really even want to do the religious leaders a favor necessarily. He just wanted it over with but he had no compunction about, about punishing him to get the job done. Now, verse 18, the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. You've had the religious leaders screaming, screaming first at Jesus and, and going after him and then screaming at Pilate what he has to do and then screaming at Herod what he has to do. And now they've incited, it, the whole crowd is shouting. And you need to get the picture here. These are the same people that seven days before are throwing palm fronds down in front of the colt that Jesus is riding and calling Hosanna to the highest. 
and praise be to God as he came into Jerusalem, who listened to him intently every day, hung on his every word in the temple courts, who listened time and again when he deflected the accusations and the questions of the leadership, instead and turned it to the word of God and turned it to the prophecies and turned it to the truth about the love of God. And I have asked my entire ministerial life, how in the world do you turn a crowd that around in seven days? And I've heard a lot of different answers. I've heard them say, you've got to understand, the Jewish leadership held the key for people to being able to go to the synagogues. And the synagogue was everything. It wasn't just your worship center. It was where your kids went to school. It's where everybody went for social activities because it was the social center of the community. And if you were thrown out of the synagogue, you were thrown out of the lives of the people, you were shunned and isolated from everyone else. Everyone else assures you were a leper. And so they say, well, the religious leaders had hold over them. I don't know. The religious leaders may have been standing at the back, getting, pumping the crowd up and, you know, and, and, you know, and trying to get them uh, to follow their lead. I don't know what it was, but I find it just shocking how quick sin can envelop us. The same people who are declaring him the son of God are not de now declaring that he needs to go to a cross and be crucified. As surely as Peter was caught in it when he denied him, as surely as Judas was caught in it when his heart turned to himself instead of his Lord. These people were willing to let a murderer go free for the sake of sending Jesus to the cross. For the third time, verse 22, he spoke to them. Why? And you know, and at this point, I almost see, I almost see Pilate in such frustration because, because he's, he's talked to him and come out to him. He's talked to him and he's come out to him. He's talked to him and had him beaten. Now he's come out to him. And he's going, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I'll have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. What do you think about when you go to communion? Yes, he is the son of God. And by the way, that, that's accurate. He is the son of God. It's not he was. But he also is a human being. Totally sinless. Undeserving of any of this that would happen to him. And totally, like he said in the garden, willing to do his father's will. The last line, it says that Pilate surrendered Jesus to their will. But what they didn't know is, is that their will, even though it was being fueled by Satan, was in fact surrendering to the Father's will. Who would allow his son to die on the cross for our sins. Guys, I think that this story, which is so well known to us, and I'm grateful as a church that we take time every Sunday to remember its ramifications for us in our lives. But I think because of that, it has become so commonplace for us, such a natural part of the fabric, and, and, and I believe that it should be one of the most difficult things for us to hear, to imagine. Why? Because it's the enormity of what God did. It's the enormity about what Jesus was willing to endure. Die for your sins. Be punished for your transgressions.
suffer for your iniquities. The story's coming to a conclusion. We'll pick it up again next week. Thank you so much for being here. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much, and there's so much about your love that is in this story, and it's, it's hard to see that for all of the other things, for the lies that were told, for the beatings that were endured, for the fickle crowd that at one minute is praising his name and in the next minute is willingly watch, watching him go to die. Lord, it's hard for us to wrap, uh, uh, wrap our arms around that being love, but it's the enormity of, or the truth of, for God so loved the world, for you so loved us that you sent your son. Help us to cherish the gift that we've been given. Help us to bow in awe of the sacrifice that was made. Help us to treat each other with the same wonder and love that your son treated you by following your will all the way to the cross. Father, thank you for once again allowing us to be together and studying together. Thank you for being our Lord, watching over us each and every day. Thank you so much for the virus, for the things that are coming now to perhaps start to bring it to a conclusion. We know it comes from your hand. All of this is the gifts that come from above and from you only. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.